Hello again, and welcome back to another episode of the Bible in One Year with the Preacher's Husband. Today, we're talking about Joshua chapter 5, 6, 7, and 8. Tomorrow, we'll be talking about Joshua chapters 8, 9, and 10. Now today, we are going through some stuff, some battles. Chapter 5 starts out with circumcision of, circumcision of the Israelites. Now, the Israelites were circumcised at first with Moses, but as they went through time, the, the next generation of Israelites was not circumcised because the Israelites did not follow the rules like they were supposed to. They didn't have them. So God said, look, Joshua, you got to circumcise everybody. So there they go. They went through their circumcision. And I found it interesting that in chapter 11, the day after Passover, they ate unleavened bread and roasted grain from the produce of the land. And the day after they ate from the produce of the land, the manna ceased. That manna from heaven that fed them for all of these years ceased to come down. Since there was no more manna for the Israelites from this day forward, they ate from the crops of the land of Canaan that year. And that is a sign of being home sweet home. Because God said he would provide for them until they got to the land of Canaan. And that's exactly what happened. He stopped providing that manna. At this point, the land itself that God provided to them was going to provide their food from here on. Then there was this little interesting blurb about the commander of the Lord's army. It says in verse 14, when Joshua asked, who you, who are you? Are you here for us or for our enemies? And the guy replied, neither. I have now come as commander of the Lord's army. And Joshua bowed to him. The man's title, commander of the Lord's army, suggests that he was some someone of importance. The relevant question here was not whether he was for or against Joshua, but how Joshua regarded this, this man. Joshua bowed and worshipped to the guy. The man's command to remove his sandals in the following verses, it kind of gives you a throwback to when God commanded Moses to remove his sandals at the burning bush. And that was in Exodus chapter 3 verse 5. And then at the gates of Jericho. Chapter 6. Now Jericho was strongly fortified because of the Israelites. No one leaving and no one entering. Hmm. The gates of Jericho were shut in chapter 2, verse 7 as well. So here the place is very similarly described as being strongly fortified. Now that word strongly fortified literally translated means very much shut. Now this describes both the physical defense of the town but also the resistance of the people to the plans of God. They were both shut, very much shut to defend themselves and they were shut to following the plans of God or going with God. They were not Israelites. They did not agree with God's plans. So they were going to rebel against it and defend themselves. And what happens? Dun, da, 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 the horns honk, of course. They march. God tells them to march around the city with all the men of war circling the city one time. Do this for six, six days. Have seven priests carry seven ram's horns trumpets in front of the ark. But on the seventh day, march around the city seven times while the priests blow the trumpets. When there is a prolonged blast of the horn and you hear its sound, have all the troops give a mighty shout. Then the city wall will collapse and the troops will advance, each man straight ahead. And that is exactly what they did. Now there was an emphasis here on seven times. And that seven times and that seven days that they refer to, coincides with the Feast of Unleavened Bread, celebrating God's defeat of the enemies of his people. That was the purpose of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, celebrating God's victory. The seventh day was the number of perfection, of course, and that shout that they're talking about was a war cry uh, of uh, victory in war. And that is exactly what they did. And there was a there was a bit of an interesting thing that happened here. They did exactly as Joshua told them. Each man straight ahead. They captured the city. They completely destroyed everything in the city with the sword. Every man, woman, both young and old, and every ox, sheep, and donkey. And they even let 
Rahab and her family be spared. But again I say, they obeyed Joshua just like they obeyed Moses. <laughs> they didn't. Somebody did exactly what God told them not to do. God told them to keep all of the spoils from war, the silver and the gold and the, the expensive stuff, and put it in a treasury for God, for church. And somebody didn't do it. In chapter 7, it says, The Israelites, however, were unfaithful regarding the things set apart for destruction. Achan, son of Carmi, son of Zabdi, son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took some of what was set apart. The Lord's anger burned against the Israelites. So, Josh, Joshua sent some men from Jericho to Ai, which is the next town that they were going to attack. He said, go up and scout the land. And after returning, they came back and said, ah, you don't need but maybe two or 3,000 people there. There's not a lot of them. And, you know, don't wear out all of our fighters. Just a couple thousand will do. But when they did that, they sent them. The men of Ai struck down about 36 of the guys and then started chasing them. And the people started to lose heart. They're like, oh my gosh, they're killing our people. So they run away. And Joshua, of course, tears his clothes and gets down on his knees and talks to God says, why did you bring these people across the Jordan for this, Lord? And Lord says to him, stand up. Why have you fallen face down? Israel has sinned. They have taken some of what was set apart. Just like we said, they did not obey. So Joshua goes back and tells them, God says, I will no longer be with you unless you remove from among you what is set apart. So Joshua does it. He goes and he tells the Israelites, here's what's going to happen. And God told him, the one who is caught with the things set apart must be burned along with everything he has because he has violated the Lord's covenant and committed an outrage. Well, the next day, Joshua gets up early and he calls forth the tribe of Judah, which was the tribe that he knew the person who stole the stuff was from. Then he calls forth, forth the Zerahite clan. And then from that Zerahite clan, he called forth, forth the Zabdi, which was the head of the family. And Zabdi's family came forward, man by man. And then Achan, son of Carmi, was selected. And when he Joshua talked to Achan, he said, Give my son, give glory to the Lord, the God of Israel, and make a confession to him. I urge you, tell me what you have done, and don't hide anything from me. And Achan replied, and he admitted it. I did it. I took it. I took this. Um, I took this silver, and I took this gold, and of course, I took this uh, beautiful cloak from Babylon that I just liked. And uh, Joshua sent messengers to his tent to go get them, and of course, they get them and fetch them and bring them back and they took care of business. Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan, the son of Zerah, the silver, the cloak, and the bar of gold, his sons and daughters, his ox, donkey, and sheep, his tent, and all that he had, and brought them up to the valley of Anchor. And all of Israel stoned them to death. They burned their bodies, threw stones on them, and raised over him a large pile of rocks, that remains still today. And then they go forward to the conquest of Ai. Now, God told them to treat Ai and its king as you did in Jericho, and its king, except that you may plunder its spoil and livestock for yourselves. See, that's different from, the, from when they took Jericho. All the stuff was to go to God. But when they go to Ai, all the plunder they got to keep for themselves. You wonder why that is. Well, I think about giving that first portion to God. The first portion of their plunders as they start this conquest all went to God. It had to go to him. And the one that didn't give all of that the first portion to God was punished. So this portion is for them. They get to take everything that's there. So they did. They took over and they plundered and um the cattle, the spoils of, spoils of war they took for themselves. Joshua burned Ai and left it in a permanent ruin, still desolate today. He hung the body of the king of Ai, or I, or A, however you want to pronounce it, on a tree until evening, and at sunset Joshua commanded that they take his body down from the tree. They threw it down at the entrance of the city gate and put a large pile of rocks over it, which still remains today. Now they took, remember, 
when you hung somebody, God said, don't leave them hanging up overnight because the curse that would fall on that person will, will spread to the people. So they had to take the body down. They couldn't just leave them hanging high in the streets forever. So they took him down and buried him, and they said those rocks still remain today. And I'm wondering if maybe this little pile of rocks right here in this picture in the forefront could potentially be part of that pile of rocks that covered it. Because what you see in the background of this picture is the North Hill, north of where they believe the, the, the town of Ai or I or E, whatever, however you want to pronounce it, was. Because it was a north-facing city. Of course, when he stood on the hill north of it and he approached the city, he approached the city from the, from the north, heading south, so their gate faced north. And all of this is biblically accurate, and this location is biblically accurate for that as well. So, I don't know. It says here in verse 29, after they hung the body, that they put the pile of rocks on it, which still remain today. Maybe it still does. Maybe that's it. Then they have a renewed commitment to the law. And this is when Joshua builds that altar that we talked about. Remember Moses' altar that, that was supposed to be built in the land of Canaan, but he didn't build it. Joshua built it. This is the one on Mount Ebal. And it says in verse 30, At the time Joshua built an altar on Mount Ebal to the Lord, the God of Israel. This is that altar right here. It is still remaining today. Just as Moses, the Lord's servant, had commanded the Israelites, but he built it according to what is written in the book of the Law of Moses, an altar of uncut stones on which no iron tool has been used. Verse 32 says, there, there on the stones Joshua copied the law of Moses. Now and then at that point he read the law to the people. Afterward, he, after he read the law to the people, the blessings and the curses, according to all that is written in the book of laws, there was not a word of all that Moses had commanded that Joshua did not read before the entire assembly of Israel, including the women, the dependents, and the resident aliens, who lived among them. Now, tomorrow we're going to get into chapter 9, 10, and 11. And there is so much more to say about this conquest of AI and, and the archaeology, but I'm going to leave a link to an article in the description of this video. And it's going to go through why they believe that initially when they found a town, that was a different town. They thought it was AI, but nothing really seemed to add up. The location didn't add up. The, the gate was on the wrong side. But this new town that they found a few years back, it all seems to add up. And even the burnt stuff seemed to coincide with biblical accounts. So you see, a lot of times when archaeology and science seems to try and try to disprove the Bible over and over and over again, we find out later that Nothing in the Bible has been disproved, okay? It's all eventually is proven true. So I hope this has touched you. Hit the like button, the subscribe button, and of course click the little jingle bell to get notified the next time I upload a video. And I will see you tomorrow for Joshua chapter 9, 10, and 11. Be sure to read that article in the description box. Peace.